you get up, you get in trouble up here, right? You just gotta be careful. <laughs> uh, a saint of old made a statement that I want to start out with. If you want the truth to go around the world, you must hire an express train to pull it. But if you want a lie to go around the world, it will fly. It's light as a feather, and a breath will carry it. It is, well, it is well said in the old proverb, a lie will go around the world while truth is putting its boots on. Right. Father, that is absolutely true. And I pray that we can see your truth in a real way today. I pray that you permeate our hearts. We live in a world that is full of distractions, full of lies. We see things and people perpetrate things that are totally in opposition towards you. And they put truth on it. And so we stand against those things. But ignite that flame within us to fight for you, to fight for truth, for, to, and, and to fight for your word. We need you desperately. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus 17. I'll do my best to communicate what, what's in there. And I may share a little bit about what's going on in there. I may read some of it. It just depends. But it's a very interesting place. Uh, as I studied th this week and I contemplated what was going down in Exodus 17 and paralleled it to some things that I see going on in the world that I'm going to share and the challenge that I felt like God is saying to me a few weeks ago I did a, a message on contend for the faith we looked at Jude and talked about how that's a, our role is to continue to contend for the faith no matter what's going on so kind of a continuation of that but in a different way just based on some things that I've seen but in Exodus 17, let me just set the stage. The um, Israelites have, have just fled Egypt. Y'all know that story. They get out into the desert and they're, they're roaming around. They're traveling from place to place based on where the Spirit leads them. And they end up in a place called Rephidim. And this is right after they're complaining about not having water and Moses saying, Oh Lord, I don't know what to do with these people. They're always complaining, blah, 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 murmuring. He said, Take your staff, hit the rock and water will flow. So the Lord provided water. Well, then shortly thereafter, they're still camped out about, around this little um, area, and there's this group of nomads called Amalekites. They live out in the desert. Well, they had caught wind that they had fled from Egypt. You're talking about a lot of people. Well, they start attacking the Israelites from behind. And they're attacking those that are weak. They're attacking those that are a little fragile. They're attacking those that can't keep up. So Moses says, no, we're not going to do this. And you've got to realize, they've been in bondage. They're not warriors. But they're trying to do what the Lord is leading them to do. And they're out in the desert trying to hear from Him. And if you look at chapter 17, it says, The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites of Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. <sighs> yes. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the, fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. That's pretty powerful to me. We had two things going on there. We had somebody engaged in battle with the sword, like hands on, we're going to fight. And then you had another person that was in prayer. And Joshua won the battle with the sword because of Moses praying. See, in any battle that we're in, both of those aspects, it's like, RJ, you have to get in the battle. You have to deal with yourself. If you want your wife and God to do something on his end, you have to get, get dirty. But you also have to pray and trust that God will do what we can't force to happen. Because Joshua could fight all day long, but without the Lord intervening, he's going to lose that battle. Verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. Make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Now if you look at the name Amalek, and you look at the history, and you look at Israelites, and you look at Amalekites, Israelites that means city of God. Amalekites, city of the world. And the writing here, this will not be forgotten. I want you to put it in the book. 
I don't want anyone to forget about this battle. Then he goes on. Moses built an altar and called it the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation to generation. Now they won this battle. But see, this battle is still going on. I mentioned that they were picking them off from behind. And sometimes we read these stories and we think, oh, it's just a nice little story about the Israelites. Give a little history lesson. No, 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 no. In Romans 15.4, it says this, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So somehow we have to take this story that's in this old book and look at it and say, how can I derive hope from that? Well, because that battle that's, that, that happened all those years ago between the Amalekites and the Israelites reflects the battle that continues on. It, it, it's a symbol of the battle that we deal with every day in spiritual warfare between God and between the world. That's when it started. As soon as they came out of captivity, that was the first battle that they entered into. And from since, since then, actually, if you look at the reality, see, the battle is between truth and deceit. And it happened way back with Adam and Eve. As soon as Satan was introduced, what did he do? He lied from the very beginning. And when you're talking about the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God, you're talking about one that's full of lies and deceit and error and everything that Satan is spitting out. And then you have the other one that is full of, of truth and love, absolute truth. And are we in that battle? The battle that we are in is, is funny. The Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nisi. Banner of truth. And that's the flag. Like if I was in a battle and you know, they have that flag, that would be the flag that I'd be flowing back and forth. This is our flag. This is our banner. We're representing the Lord. I will go to war. I will lay down my life. No matter what comes against me, I will stand for truth. Amen? If you look at this battle, it's the greatest battle in all the world. Think about it. Whether you're battling within, as I challenged RJ, you're going to have to deal with yourself. He has to, he has to deal with that thing within him that lies. That says he can't change. That says the, the devastation that's happened is too much. Like, what am I doing here? not supposed to be here. That's a lie. God has brought you here. He's trying to breathe in truth. He's trying to help you understand that He has a new plan and a new purpose for you. He's trying to breathe an understanding of who you are in Him. He's battling the lie that we take on as we engage in behavior that doesn't line up with His truth. Everybody follow me with that? Yeah. Satan is always attacking the truth and the church is always defending the truth. See that? So whether the battle is within or whether the battle is without, the battle is with truth. No doubt. The truth is the most important thing that exists. I want you to contemplate that. Like without truth, where are we? It's the most important reality in the universe. By the truth, we are saved from hell. By the truth, we are sanctified for the purposes of God. By the truth, we are given strength, we are edified, we are comforted, we are encouraged. It all comes out of divine truth, living truth, the person of Christ who dwells within us in the written truth, the Word of God, and they are perfectly in harmony. John 14 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So as soon as we walk in these doors, Brian Barber, as soon as we begin to sit ourselves before the Lord, He begins to speak the truth to the things that we've harbored inside of us that are lies that are actually detrimental to me growing up, Talakam. He's trying to destruct the, the, the lies in you and bring in truth so that you can walk in that place that God has for you. It's funny, it takes us a while to understand the truth. And then when we grasp a hold of it, freedom comes. It's not the, it's not the easiest thing. But as we believe what this, this Word tells us, and as we believe what God tells us about our future, about who we are, about who He is, things begin to change as we embrace that with everything that we have to do so. 
I'm going, to show, I'm going to give you an everyday example of this battle. Because things are happening in the world. I read that little quote at the beginning because there are so many lies being spouted out in the world today. You read something or you watch something, you're like, is, it, is, that, even, that's, is that the truth? Like, it can't be the truth. But I do have enough truth in me. When I recognize something, I say, oh, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Lord, is that not a lie? And he breathes truth. I said, okay. See, the world is full of lies. No matter whether you're watching TV, whether you're listening to something, whether you're out and about, there's lies always coming at us. And we have to decide, I am going to uh, protect the truth that's been deposited in me. But this happened this week. Anybody know Raphael Warnick? I heard of Raphael Warnick. Okay, Raphael Warnick, he's a, a sinner. He's a pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. Actually, same church that Dr. Martin Luther King pastored. He and his daddy pastored that church together way back when. Raphael Warnick, he was the gentleman that was in the Senate um, election in January that caused the disruption in the Senate. Anyway, he, he, he was one of those gentlemen. So he, he, he is a pastor. But here's what he tweeted. Exactly, word for word. The, this was on Easter Day. The meaning of Easter is more transcendent than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I go on. Whether you are a Christian or not, through a commitment to helping others, we are able to save ourselves. That's a lot. That is not what Easter is about. It's not about us helping one another. Easter, in and of itself, absolutely, absolute truth, is about Christ's resurrection from the grave. And because of that resurrection, I too have that life within me that resurrects and offers me another life. It's the greatest day in all the year. It's the most momentous occasion in history. And here he is, a pastor, saying... The meaning of Easter is more transcendent than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whether you are a Christian or not, through a commitment to helping others, we are able to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let me summarize that. That ain't the truth. That's a lie. Some other people recognize that as well. Of course, if you do anything on Twitter, uh, people jump on stuff all the time. Um, but Benjamin Watson, anybody know Benjamin Watson? He was an ex-NFL football player and uh, he's a big advocate for Christians, pro-life. Um, if, if you Google him, he, he's got some great stuff. But here's what he, he tweeted back. The resurrection reveals our inability, bold, our inability to save ourselves in this life and the next, proving Jesus alone holds that power. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Come on. Urging people to help others need not come at the expense of doctrine. To do so is heresy. Yes, a voice of truth. That's what I'm talking about. That's the battle that we are in. Now, I'm not asking anybody to go on Twitter and look for lies and read some truth. You do whatever the Lord's pointing out to you. I'm just, I'm just reflecting the fact that there is a battle. It started way back when, and we're continually in it. And we have a responsibility to continue to engage in that, not stick our head in the sand and act like it's not happening. Another guy that I thought was pretty interesting, Mark Walker. He's a former pastor. He's running for a seat in the U.S. And these political guys in North Carolina. But he said something. It was actually on video. And I was going to show the video, but I thought, let me just read it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the meaning of Easter. It is the gospel. He went on to say, as a former pastor, I hope people, no matter what your background or affiliation, will join me in calling this guy out for exactly what he is. Nothing short of a false prophet. He then said at the end of the video, may God help us in this country see truth. May God help us in this country see truth. Now let me do a time out real quick because when I start verbalizing people's names and kind of calling people out, let me, let me say this. I hate no man. I don't even know Raphael Warnick. He may, be a, he may be a good guy. But I do hate Satan and I hate air. And when someone says something against the truth of God, I better have a holy righteous anger come up out of me and be willing to, to call it out. Now, I'm not calling up Raphael. I didn't tweet anything back. I've just been chewing on that. 
and, and on my responsibility. See, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And sometimes I do get confused in that. Like I think, boy, I wish I could tell that guy something. You ever in your head tell somebody off in your head? Like you let him have it. You want what man I told him. We may even hear ourselves talking to ourselves. Somebody said, who are you talking to? Nobody. Right? We got this battle going on. That's not my fight. My fight is not against man. I love all men. We should love all men. The battle is against Satan and error. I have a right to stand and advocate for truth and not be afraid what's going to come my way if I do stand for truth. I don't hate Raphael Warren, but I do despise the lie that he propagates as a pastor. You don't have to dig too far in this book to realize that that is an absolute lie. Interestingly enough, he deleted the tweet. Mark Walker said something that I think I'm just wanting all of us to realize. May we all see the truth. Because it can get clouded. And we can, get, we can begin to buy into deceitful things kicking off inside of ourselves and the way we think, the way we perceive. And we don't put enough of this in us. And so all this other stuff is attacking this chamber of truth within us and it violates our belief system. Then we begin to believe the lie. Amen. We don't always see truth. Just, it was Friday night. I was talking to my wife about something. For the life of me, I couldn't remember what we were talking about. It sounds like we were arguing when I tell you this. I don't believe we were. But she said, you just stay over there in your little bubble of oblivion. Remember that? What we yeah. I don't know what I was in a bubble of oblivion about. I can't even remember. That's what we do in bubbles of oblivion. We don't even remember what they're about. We like our bubbles of oblivion. But she was letting me know whatever I was looking at, I was looking at it the wrong way. I wish I could remember that stuff. <laughs> You're gonna remind me, aren't you? We're over fifty, sometimes you just said we had that conversation. Yeah, we had conversation. Sometimes we like things the way we they are. We don't really we say we want the truth, but we really don't want the truth. We like to live in our little bubbles of oblivion and our little fantasies. If I were to ask you how bad do you want the truth, how would you answer that? How bad do you really want the truth? Would you want to know the truth about God? Because sometimes we like to put God in a picture that causes us comfort. And typically God's not the way that we really perceive. Do you want the truth about yourself? That's why the the sociogram gets a little tricky because people typically don't like the, the sociogram. If, if we execute the, soci the sociogram correctly, it's very loving, it's very truthful, it causes a light to shine on those spots that typically we don't like to look at. But do we, do we really want the truth? Or do we want to just keep staying in our little happy little world if everything's cool and there are, there are no problems and Jesus always loves me no matter what? Which he does. But here's my point. Most people's belief systems are based on what they desire, not based on what is true. I'm going to give you an example of that. Okay? Um, when, when I first got here, I was definitely in a bubble of oblivion. And I still am at times. But my wife, what she was saying is true. I don't always see things accurately. And God has to allow truth to permeate. But for example, when... Before the truth permeated my being, my inner being, and I began to see accurately, see, because where there is truth, there's reality. But I believe stuff like this. I believe that I love my family. I would tell you, I love my family. That was a lie. Now, you say, really? You didn't love your family? I'm, if you look at my actions, my actions speak louder than what comes out of my mouth. And my actions said... You do not love your family. Because if I did, I would not treat them the way that I treat them. That was a hard truth pill to swallow. I believed that I wasn't that bad. That's a lot. I said stuff like, but I got a good heart. Yeah, I know this and I know that, but, but I got a good heart. No, I don't. 
My heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. It was and it still is. The only thing that I got going for me is that the Holy Spirit dwells within me. You follow me? So it keeps me in check when I start getting stupid. I believe that I could live however I wanted without any resemblance of godly character and that he would still welcome me into Christian all because I said I believe in Christian or, or, or I believe in Christ. I believe in God. But I had no godly character to reflect that. And that's not totally true. Because if you look at Matthew 7, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, when you hear that, even when I, tip, when I tiptoe around that thing, people are like, whoa, what about God's grace? That's true. God is gracious. But if I think that I can live any old way that I want to like a heathen, and then walk up to heaven and say, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name, and I did that in your name, he's going to say, away from me, I didn't know you. That's the truth. It says that in here. And he had to unwind that lie that was suffocating my heart. I would tell you that I love the Lord because I grew up in a Christian home. My parents did their best. Took me where I needed to be. Took me to church. Wherever I needed to be. They tried to pour this thing in me. So I said, yeah, I love the Lord. Yes, I believe in the Lord. But Scripture says if you love the Lord, you obey Him. So did I really love the Lord? So the Lord began to uncover these lies that I carried around with me that were keeping me from embracing truth. And the fact of the matter is, truth hurts. When we really begin to look at the reality of who I am and who God is and how He deals with me, yes, He's loving Yes, he went to extreme measures. We talked about it last week. He intervenes in all of my obstinacy. And he says, I want you. Get over here. True enough. There's an old movie. You guys may remember it. As soon as I say the title, it's going to kick off in your head. A few good men. Yeah, remember that? Tom Cruise. And he was nothing but a little pup. And Jack Nicholson. And I forget. Jack Nicholson, he did something dirty. Just like Jack. He did something dirty. And they were in court. They're in trial. And um, Jack says, I think, I think he said, uh, you want truth? And he said, I want answers or something like that. And then eventually Jack just said, you can't handle the truth. Some of us can't handle truth. I know I struggle with handling truth. When I can't handle truth, it's because I don't see right or I don't want to see it right. I'm going to give you an example of a group of people that, did, that mishandled the truth. If you go to John 18, uh, this is, I'll, I'll summarize this real quick too. This is the trial. You know, the Jewish leaders were trying to take Jesus everywhere to try to get somebody to crucify him. And they finally took him to Pilate, who was the, Ro the Roman governor. And, you know, they said, listen, you got to do something with this guy. And so Pilate began to question him. And, uh, you know, he, he couldn't even really find anything wrong with him. It says that right in the scripture. And he tried to give him back. He said, you guys crucify him. And he eventually, I'm just going to jump in here. If you go to the end of chapter 18, he says, what charges are you bringing against this man? Now, this is Pilate himself saying it as he had this discussion and tried to figure things out. And they said, if you were not a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. He said, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. And they said, but we have no right to execute anyone. So they already, they didn't care what the truth was. They had a plan they wanted to execute. <coughs> and then later on in chapter 19, it says, well, here's what he did. He claimed to be the son of God. That was his charge. So it says we have no right to execute anyone. Verse 33, Pilate went back inside the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Asked him a simple question. Jesus, is that your own idea? Did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus' response, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate says, oh, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born, listen, 
Jesus is laying it out right here. He's breathing truth right now, unlike any other time. You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Think about this. He's talking to Jesus. He's right in front of them. They're talking about truth. His next question is, what is truth? And he says it in a facetious, sarcastic way. He doesn't wait for an answer. He's got the mob yelling to him what, what they desire him to do. In him, within him, he knows that there's nothing to charge him. And that's an element of truth that he did have. There was nothing to charge him with. He was guiltless. And he was asking about truth. What is truth? And he had the incarnation of truth right in front of him. Blows me away. But yet we have the incarnation of truth trying to bring words to us that are true. And we rationalize and justify and minimize and stay in our bubbles of oblivion and say, what's truth? He went back out to the Jews. I find no basis for a charge against him, but if it is your custom for me to release you one prisoner, but it is your custom for me to release you one prisoner at the time of the Passover, do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, 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 not him, give us Barabbas. And Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. So there he was. He had Barabbas on one side, he had Jesus on the other, the incarnation of truth. Deep down, he knew that there was nothing to charge him with, but yet he heard the voice of the mob. And the voice of the mob in relative truth said, no, we believe this to be true. So you do this. Relative truth. You believe what you want to believe. I believe what I believe and we're all good. And that's not true. He bought in a relative truth by mob rule. It is interesting to me. If you go into chapter 19, he put a sign. He put together a sign that they put above him on the cross. It said this. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And the teachers of the law said, no, 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 no. Don't put that. Don't put that. Um, they said, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. And he said, no, I've written what I've written. Whew. Now, Pilate, I don't know what he faced when he met his maker. Right, but you can see that battle in that moment. You have the teachers of the law. See, they didn't want their truth to be disrupted. They had a, an idea of what this was supposed to look like. And they didn't want to give up their power and authority and control. So now you have the Messiah, the Son of God, stepping into the story. And they're like, oh no, we've got to get rid of this guy. And you have Pilate trying to navigate in a political sense. What do I believe to be truth? Do I believe the incarnate truth? Or do I believe the truth of the mob? And everything in the world is spitting at me. And he fell to mob truth. Which was a lie. Veritas Christo et Ecclesiae. It's Latin. Truth for Christ and the church. Truth for Christ and the church. This was the original motto of Harvard. Harvard University. It was founded in 1636. Now listen, Harvard was founded with the intention of raising and training Christian ministers. A man gave them the property for that distinct purpose. In accordance with that vision, Harvard's rules and precepts they adopted in 1646. Like, how are we going to operate? What are our ordinances? What are our rules? What are our precepts? As they began on this journey, actually the first 108 universities that were formed, 104 of them, were for the same purpose, to raise up Christian ministers. But here were some of their adopted precepts. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, Christ 
which is eternal, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only gives wisdom, let every one seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him. And then another one, that everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day that he shall be ready to give such an account of his proficiency therein, both in theoretical observations of language and logic and in practical and spiritual truths. As his tutor shall require according to his ability. Seeing the entrance of the word gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. 1646, Harvard University. Harvard's current motto is wary toss. They've left out for Christ and the church. It's just truth. Or is it really truth? Something interesting. If you go, if you, those are. If you look at these seals on the left, you can see in the middle. That's their original seal, and in there it says Christo et Ecclesiae. On the right, it's just Veritas. Something else pretty wide. You see the three books in the center. You can't tell. It's kind of a blurry picture. But the two books on top are right side up, and the one on the bottom is upside down. It reflects the fact that there is a limit to man's reasoning. And in order to function in life, you have to have revelation from God. And on the right, those three books are all right side up. That there is no limit to man's reasoning. He is God in and of himself. There's a lot more history there with him, but I think it is a great example for us not to emulate or, or to follow. I'm going to read a scripture to you and kind of this brings truth into what is really going on right now in the world. And it's been going on. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their, fo and their foolish hearts were darkened. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Those scriptures are right in Romans 1. I pulled out a few of them, just to make it shorter. You read Romans 1, and it'll tell you exactly what happens with truth, and what our role is as far as standing for truth. Where he Christo at Ecclesia. May we not forsake him. That should be our motto. I'm going to end with a quote as well. Yet surely there must be some who will fling aside the dastard love of peace and speak out for our Lord and for His truth. A craven spirit is upon many and their tongues are paralyzed. Oh, for an outburst of true faith and holy zeal. <laughs>